disclaimer, in this video I say the word babushka doll a lot, which is what I grew up knowing these as. And if you Google search babushka doll, that's what comes up! But a lot of people let me know in the vlog behind the scenes of making this video that uh, it's called a matryoshka doll. So just putting that correction out there from the beginning, but Google search backs me up. So uh, let me know in the comments if you know it as the babushka doll or the matryoshka doll. Either way, I hope you love this video and I stand by the babushka doll because so does Google. Like a lot of you watching this, when I first heard news of Stanley passing away, I was a bit sad. The sort of sad you feel when you're feeling selfish. But I know in reality, I don't know Stanley. I just love a lot of what he's made. And of course, I'm an artist and animator and illustrator, and I've been inspired by his creations through most of my life. And of course, being in our channel, one of the things I started to see immediately was a lot of people asking me to make a video on Stan Lee, which my initial reaction is to not do. In fact, I actually had a stream a week back where I outright said that I wouldn't make a video on Stan Lee. This is it. This is what I would say about Stan Lee if I did a video on the channel. I think he is the epitome of how art and creativity can change the world. And I think that's amazing. I don't think it's sad that Stan Lee died at 95 having created characters that built an empire of billions of dollars and inspired millions and millions of people around the world. And I think he's got one of the biggest le legacies anyone in the modern day and age could possibly have. And as an artist, as a creative, I could only hope to have an nth of the impact that Stanley has had. So I celebrate his life and am so grateful that we have had him. There you go, that's what I would say. I don't wanna make a whole video out of it because that feels view grabby and not interested in that, especially when it's something that actually matters to people. It actually matters to me, not that I like, I'm super fanboy or like emotional about Stan Lee, but what he represents and what he's created absolutely is so inspirational and means a lot to me personally, as it, he does to a lot of you. Which is why a lot of people are making tributes and all that stuff, but I'm not interested in, in doing that. I shared my thoughts in that Twitch stream, but was just going to leave it at that until this arrived in the mail. <laughs> See, I have the weird habit of buying random crafty crap off eBay because I like having random things to make videos with and this babushka doll arrived right at the end of last week and I realized that an homage to Stan Lee in a babushka doll would be kind of perfect. In fact, I couldn't think of anything that would be cooler use of this babushka doll because he's the creator on the outside and inside of him are all of his characters. And I thought it would just be a really fun way to honor Stan Lee in my own little way in a way that I can share with you guys. And I like to think that Stan Lee coming across as such a positive, fun-loving guy would appreciate being remembered via babushka. I mean, it's, it's fun just saying the word. Seriously, say it out loud, babushka, right? <laughs> it's how he would have wanted it. <laughs> so let's start off with Stan, the man. Stan the man Lee, as I like to call, I, okay, maybe I don't like to call him that, but I do now. And he was born under the name Stanley Martin Lieber, and he grew up with a love of writing and one day wanted to write the great American novel. The only reason people know him as Stan Lee is because he used it as a pseudonym later when he was working for a division of pulp magazine in Timely Comics, and he used Stan Lee as a pseudonym because at the time there was a bit of a low social status associated with comic books, and he would have been embarrassed to use his real name because he didn't want people to eventually associate his real name with the comic he wrote when, of course, later he would write the great American novel. He started off in 1939 as an assistant, where his job was to make sure that artists' ink wells were full to get their lunch, proofread, and erase pencils from finished comic book pages. And though superhero comics were in a bit of a downturn, later in the 1950s, DC reinvented The Flash, which sort of led to the creation of the Justice League, and things were on the up and up. And eventually, this led to Stan Lee creating the Fantastic Four, his first major creation of what would eventually become the iconic Marvel lineup of heroes. And I think what's most interesting about this, frankly, is that he was turning 40 when this happened. When, when he started what would eventually become his massive legacy of Marvel superheroes, he was at a point where a lot of people turning 40 might think if they wanted to start a creative career, it might be too late to get started. But I just love that Stan Lee is proof that really there is no too late. 
you can just start and not only can you start, you can make an impact with your creativity. Now the popularity of the early Marvel comics grew so quickly that in order to stay on top of deadlines and maintain his workload, Stan Lee adopted a method previously used by other comic studios and due to Lee's success with the method it became known as the Marvel Method where instead of writing full scripts the writer would come up with a synopsis which was used by the artist to illustrate the full panel to panel story rather than following a line by line script script handed to them from the writer, and this method made the process way more collaborative between the artist and the writer, which is also why names like Jack Kirby, one of the early Marvel uh, artists, is synonymous with the story of early Marvel because of the collaborative nature between the artist and the writer, made particularly famous through Marvel's method. Now within the Babushka doll inside Stanley, I was originally going to start off with the Hulk, because he's, you know, the biggest, but given that the Fantastic Four was the first, I thought I would do the thing as a bit of an homage to his first major Marvel creation. Now there is some dispute as to how they actually originated. Stan Lee and Jack Kirby have different accounts on the team's conception. However, what is known is that at the time, teams of superheroes were becoming more and more popular. And DC, as I mentioned, had the Justice League of America, which was extremely popular. And according to Stan Lee, at the time he was thinking about leaving the comic book industry to pursue something seen as more legitimate. Then his wife suggested that he should at least write one book the way he believed it should be written. And he had nothing to lose since he was going to quit anyway, so he set out to create a team of superheroes. But not just a clone of the Justice League, Stan Lee wanted to create a team of more relatable superheroes with flaws. The superhero team consisted of four characters that possessed none of the same characteristics to each other and no secret identities because Lee believed that if he himself had a superpower, he wouldn't want to hide it from anyone. I thought of the Fantastic Four as more than just a team, really, but a family. Reed was the father of the family, so to speak, and then the the heroine, she knew who he was, there was no secret identity, and she was engaged to him. And Johnny Storm, her brother, once they got married, he would be the, the brother-in-law. And of course, the thing would be the family's best friend. So to me, they were a nice, tight-knit, familial group. He created the Fantastic Four with no alter egos, no flashy superhero outfits, and he implemented more complex character traits. Each character with their own motivations, conflicts, desires, and frustrations. I thought it'd be so interesting if the, their relationship was very deep, and what could be deeper than having Reed, the leader of the group, feel guilty because the one member who had been horribly affected, who had been turned into a semi-monster, because that had happened due to a project that Reed had fostered. And therefore, Reed always had this guilt feeling, and his friend, The Thing, who was an incredibly close friend, and they would have died for each other, but deep down, the friend would not have been human not to have had some sort of a lingering resentment because of what had happened to him because of Reed's project. So I thought that also gave the group a dimension and, and a feeling of reality. There were emotions involved that I felt the readers could relate to. The success of the Fantastic Four led to the creation of many iconic Marvel properties, of course, such as the Inhumans, Black Panther, Adam Warlock, and many of Marvel's most iconic villains, like Doctor Doom, who appeared in the first issue of the Fantastic Four. But of course, when we're talking about iconic superhero properties birthed by Stanley, we have to touch on Spider-Man. Saying touch on Spider-Man sounds a bit creepy, but you know what I'm talking about. The concept for Spider-Man, according to Lee, arose after the success of the Fantastic Four where there was a surge in teenage demand for comic books, Lee decided to create a character that the teenagers who were reading his comics could really identify with. So rather than having an infallible superhuman hero with immense power and confidence, he decided to have a hero with an identity problem marked with an inferiority complex and who has a fear of women. And the major struggle he faced as a hero was being misunderstood and persecuted by the very people he was trying to protect. To make him empathetic with the, with the readers, I figured I would let him be not that good looking, not that successful with girls. He doesn't have a lot of money. He, in fact, he doesn't have enough money. He's an orphan who lives with his aunt and uncle. I thought that would make him relatable to a lot of kids. 
Now to say that this worked well would be a severe understatement. Obviously we all know that the initial Sam Raimi Spider-Man movies were one of the biggest successes as far as modern superhero movies go and were a major kickstart in what eventually turned into a massive superhero obsessed movie going culture which still of course is stronger than ever today. But even earlier than that, in fact in 1965 on college campuses it was found that Spider-Man along with the Hulk were viewed as the most revolutionary evolutionary cultural icons alongside the likes of Bob Dylan. And within one year of publishing the amazing Spider-Man solo comic book series, it surpassed the Fantastic Four as Marvel's top selling comic book. Next let's touch on Iron Man. Now you might notice that the uh, babushka designs I'm going with are as close to the uh, more original popular comic book designs as possible rather than the modern cinematic takes on the characters. I figured that was a, I don't know, more appropriate homage to Stan Lee's early influence and the way these characters came about since he's literally birthing them from inside his babushka body. <laughs> and Iron Man was born on March 1963. Now Stan Lee had been toying with the idea of a businessman superhero. In fact Stan wanted to create a hero that was immediately dislikable. Tony Stark was written during the Cold War and Stark was created to represent war to the hundredth degree. He was super rich, he was a weapons manufacturer and he was for all intents and purposes invulnerable. He created a character that was was so powerful on the outside but inside was a wounded figure. In fact if you think about the wound on his chest and the way that it's worked into the narrative of the comics it's almost literally the representation of a broken heart. He was an inventor, an industrialist, he made munitions, all the things the kids hate but I said I'm gonna make the kids like him and apparently they did. Iron Man was a very successful strip. Now of course the character saw a successful comic book series and even animated TV show but the success that most of us will be very familiar with was the success of the first Iron Man film released in 2008 and of course the one that sparked the very beginning of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And moving on later in 1963 we arrive to the X-Men. Now I want to point out at this point that we've only just progressed by like a year and a half. Spider-Man was created in 1962 in August. So already like three of the most massive popular franchises were just written within a year and a half of each other. The X-Men were created because Stan Lee wanted to create another group of superheroes but didn't want to explain how they got their powers. So Lee decided that the X-Men were mutants born with their powers. The toughest thing is to figure out where does a superhero get his or her power from. I was really stymied and then inspiration hit. I realized I'm going to take the cowardly way out. If I say that my heroes are mutants and they were just born that way, I don't have to explain anything. I don't have to use radioactivity. They're born that way. That's it. Take it or leave it. See, that's how clever, I mean, how inventive I am. Uh, they're born that way, now leave me alone. <laughs> the stories of the X-Men include themes based around prejudice and racism and he has stated that the evil side was usually depicted as regular humans or Magneto who was a survivor of a Nazi concentration camp and had developed a hatred for normal humanity. Essentially the villains or, or extremes outside of the X-Men were usually the ultra conservative paranoid and angry normal people or mutants with an ultra superiority complex. Cyclops, the character you can see me working on here, was Stan Lee's favourite X-Men because he loved the concept of a tortured hero. This was represented of course by Cyclops' inability to control his powers at all. Cyclops was written to represent the typical hero which famously leads him to often clash with Wolverine who would of course become the typical anti-hero. Now Stan Lee didn't write Wolverine, I was originally actually going to do Wolverine as one of the Bushka characters but felt it fit most to keep it to the character Stan Lee wrote himself. So Cyclops it is, plus it was his favourite X-Men. So it makes sense. Last but not least we have Ant-Man. Not because he was chronologically later, in fact he was sort of before the last bunch I've talked about. But of course it's the smallest part of the Babushka doll and I had to leave him till last because he's so little and that's the main reason why I saved him till last. It wouldn't be appropriate if I did anything else. Anyway, the original Ant-Man had his first appearance in issue 27 of 
Tales to Astonish, which was actually meant to be just a solo one-off story. But then Lee saw how well the issue performed and decided to turn Hank Pym into one of Marvel's superheroes. Anyway, that brings us to the end of the Babushka characters I have created because they don't go down any more than that. So there are obviously many, many more characters Stan Lee has written and many, many more stories he has influenced. And these were just the ones I felt most appropriate for the amount of babushka I had to work with. And suffice it to say that even just with these characters alone, Stan Lee's legacy as a creator and inventor of worlds that would connect with people and inspire others to pursue their own creativity or even just be an everyday superhero in their own way will be one of his greatest legacies and something that I don't think he even imagined would have grown to the extent that it has. And I for one love that this man who lived to the ripe old age of 95 saw the fruits of his work come about, the impact that his creativity's had. And I love that someone so positive has had that effect on the world in what began as something conceived as trivial or nonsensical to the degree that hundreds of millions of people see as legitimate and exciting and inspiring today. And here we have my final babushka or matrushka. This turned out way better than I expected, which just makes me so happy. And look, look at the glisten of the, the final coat of varnish. Really almost makes it look like manufactured, like you'd find this in a shop, which is really cool. By the way, you can literally just go to the start of the video and then back to now and see four days of facial hair growth on me. I know it's not very impressive, but this has taken a long time to do. So here we have Stan. He's got a, a book of some sort. Could be a comic book, could be a script for a... Uh, an upcoming character or, or comic series. He's got his pen. I really like the way that it, it turns out with the line work on top and just that subtle little level of shading. And then inside Stanley, we have the thing. Here we go from the Fantastic Four. I love how like all of the characters just look like little fatties, like really adorable little fatties. <laughs> it's so fun. The texture on him looks really cool and uh, is softened even by the varnish because it sort of brings it all into just the one level. And then inside the thing we have Spider-Man, Spider-Man. Again, just this adorable little fatty Spider-Man. <laughs> it's really cute. I look at look at the bum. Look at his spider bum. He's got this cute little chubby bum. I don't know why I find that so adorable. <laughs> this is just so fun. Like this this is, was like Probably one of my favorite ideas that I, I randomly got. Here's Iron Man. I like uh, I like those little highlights around him. But again, we've gone with the classic comic book Iron Man aesthetic. And we have Cyclops, one of the original X-Men. There he is, look at him. Look at him with his little stern face and his little chubby bum. <laughs> wait for it, wait for it. Oh, this Ant-Man. <laughs> it's so little. Look at him. Just look at him! He's so little! <laughs> little things are adorable. That's what she said. I spent longer on this video than I expected to, or probably would have been comfortable doing knowing how long it would have taken, but I'm really glad that uh, I took the time to make it as good as I possibly can. I love the result. I really hope you do too. And I feel like even though I didn't plan on doing any sort of a Stanley tribute because I didn't want to ride the Stanley tribute train, so to speak, I think at the end of the day, when you're especially a part of a creative career path, which owes so much of what has inspired you to someone's creativity. I think it's pretty fitting. So I'm, I'm really glad I did this. Thank you all for asking me to do something. I hope this fits. If you enjoyed it, of course, make sure to like this video and subscribe to Draw with Jazza. I do loads of different stuff. I've never done a Russian nesting doll before and I probably won't again, but I always do different random and often surprising things and we have a lot of fun doing it. So make sure to stick around if you want to see more fun with creativity. Otherwise, I'm going to let Stan himself wrap up in what I feel are some of the most fitting words on the power of creativity, which really, I think the power of creativity, that phrase itself embodies what I think has been so powerful about what Stanley has left as his legacy. So Stan, take it away. The one thing that will never change is the way we tell our stories of heroism. Those stories have room for everyone, regardless of their race, gender, religion, or color of their skin. That man next to you, he's your brother. That woman over there, 
she's your sister. And that kid walking by, hey, who knows? He may have the proportionate strength of a spider. We're all part of one big family, the human family. And you, you're part of that family that moves ever upward and onward to greater glory. In other words, excelsior.